You need to know who inspired you. Who were your heroes growing up? Oh, who inspired man. you to want to make music? Um, I just thought what a great job this would be <laughs> to be able to play all day long, never leave the sandbox, you know, because everybody likes playing in the sandbox. And I thought if we could play music all the time or record music, it's like playing in the sandbox. So who actually uh, inspired me? Well, geez, it was Led Zeppelin, it was the Beatles, it was, you know. You know the Stones, everybody else. It was, yeah, you know, mostly Zeppelin and the Beatles. Wow. You know, they were the ones that said, oh my God. First off, the Beatles said it could be really cool and really complex. And then Zeppelin said, no, it isn't. It can be. And it's all about feel and Power. Now you've had, you know, you've had a storied career. So many artists we've ended up with. Give us that quick kind of path of when when you started recording and how it elevated to you. Actually, we were just talking about you know being at Sound City and then opening Goodnight LA. Well, <coughs> actually, <coughs> excuse me. It it started you know when I was uh, when I formed a rock and roll band. You know, it was, you know, with Sean Bonniewell and a couple other guys like Mark Landon and Ron Edgar and Doug Rose who formed the Music Machine. And we had Talk Talk. And it was from there, it went, you know, it started ballooning and just mushrooming and mushrooming from that. And then got into, uh, got into Sound City, got involved in Sound City. It was all about that sound. And then by a fluke kind of, and got to have a little bit of ownership of the place and then got to design a console that seemed to be the, you know the, the dividing line between uh, every so many people's lives before and after uh, was that console at Sound City and so then it was Buckingham Knicks, Fleetwood Mac uh, and then on to uh, you know Foreigner and Grateful Dead and <clears throat> Santana yeah. and Hart and then over to Goodnight LA where it was Benatar and Springfield and, and on and on and on. And then yeah. it was the fun stuff with Ozzy and, and the Scorpions and all the White Snake albums. And mm -hmm. So it was, it, it was really fun. And in fact, I spoke with David Coverdale just, you know, uh, I don't know, a month ago. And we were talking about how much fun we had making music. And yeah. it really was fun. And that's what it's got to be. I mean, take all this internet and these shortcuts and the widgets, take all that away. If it's not fun, what do you got? Well, if it's not fun, it's like work. <laughs> you know, but you're supposed to play music. You're not supposed to work music. Yeah. So when it becomes work, it's no longer really fun. Yeah. Well, let's talk about those classic, you know, uh, Fleetwood Mac era. So it was, it, it was Lindsay that you met first, or how well, did that evolve? Uh, I, I was one of the D-list producers. Mm. Well, that's you know, I was, you know, there was this, there was this guy who was a promoter and and manager who had an act up north uh, in uh, San Jose and he wanted he called all the A-list producers to fly up to see this band and they all said oh, no 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 so he went on to the B-list nobody wanted to go then he went to the C-list then they came to the D-list and they and I said hey you mean I get a free trip to, <laughs> to San Jose sure I'll go up to San Jose and see a band so I went up to see a band called Fritz and it was, and they, and Lindsay and uh, uh, the drummer picked me up in the band van, and I helped carry in the amps and helped set up. You know, I was D-list. You got to remember it was. Yeah. Uh, but I met Stevie and Lindsay, and Lindsay was a bass player, and, and and I thought, man, the two of them sing so well together. That's really special. And sorry to say, I didn't think the band was special, but they were. Mm -hmm. And so when I brought them back to Sun City and we uh, started cutting and I sold that project uh, to a record company, 
who funded the project, and we did Buckingham Knicks. And then from that, I played that album for McFleetwood, and then he said, do you think they would want to join my band? And then it went, so then I did that project, and then that album just took off. It was a defining album of 1970-something or other. You know, Besides great songs, what do you think it was the chemistry with all oh, those it was, players? Oh, it was the sound. <clears throat> it was definitely the sound of the harmonies. Uh, it was different. It was unique. I mean, the songs were stunning. It was landslide. Oh, my God. I mean, today, Budweiser uses landslide. You know, it's, it's Still being for, their, for, that, for their main soundtrack for their main push for this for, from the Super Bowl through this year so when you heard the song for the first time you knew they were special <sighs> they were just so special landslide was, was uh, written in my bedroom you know Stevie and Lindsay always had fights you know they were a kind of a combustible <laughs> combustible which is is that's what as Carol Payne taught taught me a long time ago it's that life experience you put in that bag and you hold those life experiences out yeah. and that's what you're writing about yeah. and you write about those things and well Lindsay and Stevie had a fight and Stevie came over and was crying on my shoulder and I said look I gotta cut this commercial tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. <laughs> if you feel this way take my guitar go in my bedroom I'll sleep on the couch write about it well she did <laughs> and it's really good. <laughs> Here it is, some forty some odd years later. Well, sometimes they say it takes some pain to Absolutely. give us pleasure. You Absolutely, know. but you it got was, to emote. It was that. It was that. Uh, that. That. You know, and it was the seed. You know, and what does a producer do? It ju they just plant seeds. You know, yeah. to get the best out of an artist at that moment in time and capture that moment in a way where. The uh, the public will get it and will be under and understand it and sure. will love it. We we'll talk about Foreigner. I mean, there was so many great records. Again, talk about how they came to you and some of the magic yeah. that was recorded, <clears throat> captured there. God, <clears throat> I was talking to Lou about uh, I don't know. It was eight years ago, um, and you know we were uh, VH1 had come doing behind the music mm -hmm. uh, and or true spin, I guess it was, and trying to find out the true meaning of double vision. And I'm saying, oh, gee, the, true, geez, well, the, the real meaning of that song. And, and so I called Lou and I said, Lou, you know, remember, when, when you wrote double vision, I mean, you know, we were in the studio already cutting the track and he had no story. And he was, and he was, he's a hockey fan. Mm -hmm. And he was watching the Rangers, you know, we were in the Stanley Cup, and this, the goalie got hit with this puck so hard, it knocked him out cold. And so they're dragging him off the ice, and the announcer says, he was hit so hard, that man's going to have double vision. And Lou just turned around and said, humans, I got double vision. And, it's, and from that time, he wrote the whole rest of the story from that one thing. And, you know... Lou is, you know, Lou is one of those natural voices, you know. Every time he sings, it's like, it puts chills on my arms. Uh, I did a, I, I was lucky enough to do a solo project with him, a band called Shadow King, mm -hmm. back <clears throat> after he left Foreigner. And there's a song on there that's Russia, that's called Russia. And it was, and I asked him to just do a reference vocal. And he just walked out and sang it there. And I would never let him touch it again. It was a one-off, and that's how good he is. He's just a natural singer. Yeah. No pitch correction, no time correction, no nothing. It was heart and soul in performance. Mm -hmm. So a lot of those classic Foreigner songs, did they just, were they, were they written before they came to the studio? Mm -hmm. Was there a lot of elements that came together? Hot-Blooded was kind of written in the studio, too. It was. Uh, they get a riff. <clears throat> we had a riff, and when we when we cut the riff, when we recorded the track, we didn't make it long enough. I mean, we had to dupe it, and mm -hmm. and back in those mm -hmm. days, it was rolling in two tape machines and cutting mm -hmm. two inch tape, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then uh, 
you know, and then when um, when we put together the solo, <laughs> there was this one pull off that I cut right on it to get try to you know, and you know, everybody hated it. Mick Jones loved it, and it's it is it's a pull off clank, and he just said, so we had oh, to yeah. learn how to play it based on how you cut it, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> but it worked. It worked really well. Wow. Now talk about urgent. I mean, it just seemed I didn't, like a, I didn't do that. Album. You didn't do that one. No. Okay. But I listened to it a million times. <laughs> Mutt Lang produced That's that, right. That one. That's right. Okay. <clears throat> so you, when you interview Lou, <laughs> ask him about it because he'll say, oh, yeah. Wow. What, what was your greatest right. memories of, of working with the band? Obviously, with this, Foreigner? Yeah, with Foreigner. Oh, God. There's, <clears throat> there were so many, but <laughs> I think, I think uh, we... We did most of it at Atlantic Studios in New York, and that studio has so much history. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's where Aretha cut all her stuff. That's where all the great blues acts <clears throat> that were on uh, Atlantic. Atlantic. And I kept the, one of the greatest memories. <laughs> it's not about recording that album, but it was walking back and forth, leaving the studio, going to the bathroom, and coming back. You walk past the tape library, mm -hmm. but in the hallway, <clears throat> standing in plain sight, were the masters for Stairway to Heaven, mm -hmm. and they're just laying out. <laughs> and I'm walking past them, saying, "Gee, I wish they would lock them away." <laughs> you right. know, that's kind of important. Yeah, it's you know? too vulnerable. <laughs> yeah, were they were pretty vulnerable. That's amazing. But that was Atlantic back then. Right. And, and Scorpions working with them? Oh, Scorpions. Oh, God. They, they are they are an amazing bunch of guys. Yeah. <clears throat> we never knew when we cut that, that uh, when we cut <clears throat> Winds of Change, that we were, uh, that it was going to be put out at a time when the, the fall the of the Berlin Wall and the reunification of Germany and that it was going to be the, the, the anthem yeah. for 100 million Germans yeah. that were coming back together again. We never knew, but they, they grabbed onto that song, and that was what it was. Mm. And, uh, <clears throat> and Send Me an Angel was really a, a, it's such a good song, too. Mm -hmm. um, they're a great bunch of guys. They really know how to play rock and roll, and <clears throat> and they're they've been uh, they've been good friends too. Yeah, it's fantastic. Well, what is your your take on production today? Because you know the technology's made it easier, easier. All these different you the know, technology's tools. made it harder. <clears throat> Talk about that. What, what <laughs> because what is you can important? do anything. So if it's time versus money, <clears throat> if you can, if you want to take enough time, you can make anybody and anything sound like anything. Mm -hmm. But it's a factor of time versus money. Now, if you have infinite amounts of time, well, the artist will be old before you get it done. <laughs> if you have infinite amounts of money, you know that that money is better spent promoting the record instead of recording it. <clears throat> so it's... Uh, uh, the tools today uh, make it wonderful, make it easy. Uh, they also make it difficult because it's hard to differentiate when you when you, you're sent something, mm -hmm. whether the artist can really sing really that well, or if somebody's done an awful lot of pitch correction and <clears throat> time adjusting and yeah. everything else to make them feel oh, like they can sing that well. Seems like a reason probably why so many of these classic bands are still popular live because they can really play and sing. Yeah, because they can play and sing. Yeah, it You've was got manufactured pop stars that are lip syncing and yes. who's gonna pay ninety dollars for that? <clears throat> well, you know, they have to they have to do so much other things, you know, they have to do uh, you know, the <clears throat> the ninety dollar uh, ticket pop stars have to put on a show with sixteen dancers and yeah. and big lights, big yeah. big everything. Sure because that's what it takes instead of getting out out there and just playing like just 
da 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 da. They can't strip it down. There's nothing there. Yeah, you can't. It's it's harder to strip it down. I'll say harder. But yet some of them strip it down really well. Sure. I mean, look. I mean, look at Taylor Swift. She can strip it down to just singing and playing all by herself, and you go. Now, now, what advice would you give to the young songwriters? You know, what what is the important elements of a song they need to focus on? Story. Got to tell a story. Got to tell a story that captivates the listener, so that the listener can claim it as their own. They, the listener, has to say, "Oh my God, they're singing that song about me." And when you claim it, you know, it's like any any good story. Oh yeah, they get captivated and they can't put it down. Sure. They cannot push the button. They cannot go to the next channel on Sirius XM. You could do too many choices. They'll just listen it through and then they'll say, oh my God, that's really good. And advice to that young band or artist, what, what do they need to concentrate on, what they don't need to concentrate on to really, you know, have a shot? Um, they have to concentrate on performance and expertise. Um, it's real easy to think that you're really good <clears throat> when you're not because good is not good enough. You have to be great. And, you know, your parents will all say, well, you're really good, and your best friend will say, God, you played really good and great. But you also have to get to the point where everybody else thinks that you're great. And so it's all about expertise, you know, and, and it takes time. Uh, I, you know, I tell kids when they ask me, what, what does it take? I ask them, how many hours a day do you practice? And if they say, oh, well, you know, half an hour, I say, well, that's not enough. You don't want it. You've got to have it. You've got to want it so bad that mm-hmm. when you get up in the morning, you start playing. And then when you fall asleep at night, you're still playing. 